Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. If I may have your attention, the, uh, the Bill Buckley trivia quiz, not that there could be anything trivial about Bill Buckley, but the Bill Buckley quiz was won by the, the geniuses at table 14. And, and even they got wrong the last question. The one person on that list who has not been on uh, Bill's show is Strom Thurmond. He's waiting to mature. It is... It is my uh, pleasant privilege tonight to uh, introduce at some length the uh, recipient of this year's Goldwater Award, uh, the man who uh, gave me my first uh, job in, in journalism and uh, uh, who therefore has a lot to live with and down. It, uh, it, the year 1964 was, of course, Barry's year in front of the country. And the country did not do as well as it should have done by Barry. That was a year when uh, I was, I was uh, in, in England, and early in 1964, when I was studying at Oxford, the Oxford University Press published the third and final volume of Isaac Deutscher's loving and glowing and idolatory biography of the communist Leon Trotsky. The Oxford Marxist Society decided to have a tea party for this man, and they being my kind of people, I went round to see them. And in the course of his remarks celebrating uh, Leon Trotsky, Isaac Deutscher said the following. He said, proof of Trotsky's farsightedness is that none of his predictions have come true yet. <laughs> well, we are here tonight uh, in the name of Barry Goldwater and to honor Bill Buckley, whose predictions and whose desires have come true and are going to increasingly come true. In 1964, we had recently seen the city of Berlin divided. We had therefore seen a city divided, the continent of Europe divided, and indeed the world divided between two opposing ideologies, a collectivist ideology and an individualist ideology. For 70 years, the Soviet Union tried to plant Marxism with bayonets throughout Eastern Europe. And today, ladies and gentlemen, there are more Marxists on the Harvard faculty than there are in Eastern Europe. Europe has, in our time, undergone a second reformation, but a reformation without a Luther. I mean, Lech Walesa is a great electrician, but no Luther. <laughs> and in fact, what we've seen is the pure power of ideas, and that is Bill Buckley's realm. William F. Buckley is the anti-Lenin of the 20th century. We have seen in our time conservatism go from a minority fringe persuasion to the dominant mood and attitude of the country. Now this huge tide did not rise from a flat sea. The symbol crash election of 1994 broke the old intelligentsia's axiom that there's a leftward moving ratchet in history, that government does not always expand, but it never contracts. Well, that ratchet has been broken by that great election of 1994. But before you could have the election of 1994, you had to have the Ronald Reagan presidency. And before you could have the Ronald Reagan presidency, you needed the Goldwater capture of the Republican Party. And before you could have the Goldwater capture of the Republican Party, you had to have an intellectual movement organized around a fighting organ, the National Review. And before you could have the National Review, you had to have Bill Buckley with a bright idea. Bill Buckley understands not just that ideas have consequences, but that only ideas have large and lasting consequences. Bill, it is well known, is a sailor. And he is therefore used to tacking into opposing winds. And that he had to do beginning in 1955, when the climate was not favorable to conservatism. But he brought to this task a, a, an unfailing cheerfulness, and indeed brought about a compatible marriage between cheerfulness and conservatism that makes it an irresistible force. 
Bill's enthusiasms are, of course, many saline, skiing, harpsichords, peanut butter. But most of all, one senses there is the abiding love of conversation and controversy. After the 1980 election, he was asked by someone what role he wanted in the Reagan administration, and he said, ventriloquist. <laughs> he, Bill has been, in a sense, a ventriloquist now to several generations of conservatives through whom he speaks. And what he says is nothing less than the traditional American faith that he has tried to restore, the faith that animated Barry Goldwater, the belief in limited government. It is, after all, a long-standing quest to get back to Philadelphia in 1787, to the constitutional work of our fathers. They wrote, by the way, if I may digress, they wrote a constitution designed for what many Americans inexplicably deplore, that is gridlock. I happen to think gridlock is an American boast. It is an American achievement. There are four billion people on this planet who live under governments they wish were capable of gridlock. <laughs> it is the product of a sophisticated system of checks and balances and separations of power, and why not? The Founding Fathers did not want efficient government, they wanted safe government. The Founding Fathers understood that a democratic government is by definition a plaything of factions and passions and appetites, and therefore most of what it does is irrational and wrong, and therefore when complaining about gridlock, why do we want it to do more things quicker? It makes no sense. Not only did they design a government to be inefficient but safe at Philadelphia, they promptly went to the first Congress of the United States and added ten amendments to the Constitution, all of which further restricted the central government. The First Amendment, of course, beginning with the five most beautiful words in the English language. Congress shall make no law. <laughs> oh, the, the government grew a bit, of course, but 85% of the growth of the federal government before the Civil War was in the post office. Now, the Civil War changed things. The Civil War gave the government a quite unnatural prestige as the deliverer of freedom. But the crucial event in the transformation of the federal government was, occurred 100 years ago this year, in the great election of 1896, when William Jennings Bryan rose from the prairies and began to articulate what came to be a dominant theme of the 20th century. He began changing the Democratic Party, did Bryan. He ran three times and lost three times. But like Barry Goldwater, he creatively transformed his party. He began to argue that the evolution of industrial capitalism was beginning to produce entities, banks, corporations, trusts, but most especially railroads that held the West in their thrall. And that these entities were as much a threat to private happiness as public sector power was, and the government, he said, must grow as a countervailing power, and grow it did. It grew under Woodrow Wilson's New Freedom and the War Socialism. It grew under the New Deal, and it reached an apogee in 1964 and 65. It is hard to remember, but well to remember, the vanity of government in those years when young Bill Clinton, an impressionable child from Arkansas, matriculated at Georgetown University 20 blocks away from the spectacle of Lyndon Johnson's White House. So convinced were we that we had mastered the management of a modern economy that the, the, the last issue of Time magazine in 1965 had on its cover a dead white European male, John Maynard Keynes. And the theme of the article was that effortless economic growth was assured for the foreseeable future, the business cycle had been repealed, and that there would be a gusher of revenues to the government in excess of existing government needs, and therefore the political problem for the foreseeable future was going to be the equitable allocation of surplus. To that end, to that end, we invented revenue sharing. That is, the worry was that there'd be a fiscal drag holding the country back, and that we had to shovel the money out to the states, then perhaps they would spend it. In a 13-month period in 64 and 65, when the federal government passed the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, Medicare and the Elementary and Secondary Education Acts, it completed the intrusion of the federal government into spheres of life hitherto thought to have been uh, not acceptable. It was in 1965 and 1966 that Sergeant Shriver, then put at the head of the poverty program, was asked in a congressional hearing, how many years would it take 
to end poverty in America, and he said about 10. Well, as I say, it didn't work out that way. The Great Society disappointed, raising questions about the competence of government. Vietnam and Watergate raised questions about the good motives of government. And the stagflation manufactured in Washington in the 1970s completed the conservatizing of the middle class. And so we went for 30 years for the 1964 elections returns to come fully in. And in 1994, Barry Goldwater finally won. Proof, proof it seems to me, of Barry Goldwater's victory and Bill Buckley's victory is the thorough extent to which the incumbent president has bought the program. Well, to be more precise, the incumbent president is running for re-election as Henry of Navarre. <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember your college history courses, but Henry was a king of France who was born and raised a Protestant, but who several times converted to Catholicism for political purposes, saying on one memorable occasion, Paris is well worth a mass. <laughs> the incumbent president has said the White House is well worth a few speeches declaring the era of big government over. But clearly what the country tried to say, if you wanted to put it in one sentence, what it said in 1994, it was this. There is something radically wrong with government that cannot deliver the mail and will not stop delivering condoms to eighth graders. That is, we have a government that is incompetent at its fundamental functions and irrationally intrusive where it has no business being at all. Now, we have entered into a particularly intense period of argument about a recurring American theme. That is, how much government do we want? And the political scientists are again belaboring us with their theory that the American people are ideologically conservative but operationally liberal. That is, that their conservatism is merely rhetorical, and that they are content to live with a large government, that they are rhetorical Jeffersonians, but practical Hamiltonians. I don't think so. I think something fundamental has changed on the part of the American people. For a very long time, they were willing to go along and say, well, we know we're not abiding by the principles of limited government, but we're getting away with it. So far, so good, they kept saying. Always reminds me of the great day in 1951 when I can't talk for long without coming back to baseball. Warren Spahn, winningest left-handed pitcher in the history of baseball, was pitching in the polo grounds against the New York Giants. He was still with the Boston Braves. And he was sailing along, and the uh, Giants sent up a rookie who was 0 for 13. It was clear the kid would never hit Major League pitching, a kid named Willie Mays. And uh, <laughs> Spahn stood out on the mound 60, fi 60 feet, 6 inches from home plate, fired the ball at Mays, and Mays crushed it. First hit, first home run, left field, upper deck. After the game, the journalist went into Spawn and said, Spawny, what happened? He said, gentlemen, for the first 60 feet, that was a hell of a pitch. <laughs> Trouble is, things catch up with you, and they've caught up with us in uh, the United States, and there is a serious rethinking of the American creed. The American creed that is the animating principle of Barry Goldwater's life and has been defended more eloquently by Bill Buckley than by anyone else in our time is simple. It is our formative inheritance as Americans. It is that individuals are responsible for their own happiness. That individuals have by natural right the rights essential for the pursuit of happiness and government exists to protect those rights not to secure happiness. And so it is, as we reacquaint ourselves with this creed, that we're undergoing a particularly intense period of rethinking and relimiting the American government. We're worried about the ecology of liberty. We're worried about the sociology of virtue. We're worried about the American soul and character. And I say the ecology of liberty. We are tired, I think, by now, of the sterility of envy as a political motive. We've seen too often people saying that the problem in America is the rich. Well, no one seems to have noticed something. The nature of wealthy households has changed. The top 10% of income earning households in this country, the typical household would be one with two income earners, each in the third decade of their careers. 
that is, say, a, an accountant and a high school principal in the third decade of the careers would be in the top 10% of income earners. They're rich. I'll give you a family in the top 2% of income earners. Let's say a 55-year-old obstetrician married to a 50-year-old lawyer. I have just described the Huxtable family of the, Bob, uh, of the Bill Cosby show. That is the rich. We've also seen the ecology of liberty undermined in our country by what I call the supply-side politics. That is, we have over and over again now programs not produced by groups demanding them, but gr demanding groups produced by the programs. I'll give you one example. During the Second World War, when sugar was scarce, honey came to be used as a sugar substitute and beeswax came to be used to waterproof munitions. At the end of the Second World War, uh, the government began to subsidize the production of honey for the Cold War period. Cold War is over. The honey program went on and on. Never mind the fact that bees made honey before they became civil servants. They just <laughs> remained subsidized. It took a Republican Congress two years to finally kill the honey subsidy. Now this is, is an example of the kind of corruption that creeps in. It's small corruption, but you get enough of those, you get a lot of it. By the sociology of virtue, I mean this. We are beginning to worry that the welfare state is beginning to have feedback effects. The phrase comes from a wonderful, serious article done in 1972 by a University of Chicago economist. At that time, Detroit was just beginning to put seat belts in automobiles, and Americans were deciding whether or not to use them. And the study demonstrated that Americans who used their seat belts suffered fewer injuries but caused more. They caused more because feeling secure, they drove more recklessly. And the analogy to the welfare state is perhaps by removing some of the risks of risky behavior, we are encouraging risky behavior. And the overarching argument driven by this Congress and driven by the Republican Party, and I hope by the Goldwater Institute, is the question of whether or not you can have the sturdy old American character with the modern American government. I think we have reasons for doubt. But what we know is that the argument we're having, we're having because the Goldwater candidacy began the argument in America about the effect of government on the national soul, and the journalism of Bill Buckley has continued that argument and brought it to a higher and higher level. We are now taking seriously the fact that government may be bad for our souls. That what American people lack are not material goods and services the government can deliver, but have instead a poverty of inner resources. The overestimation of government now sounds anachronistic, happily. Not long ago, in fact, it was two years ago, on the floor of the Senate, a man said something that could only be said without guffaws of laughter in Washington. The speaker was uh, Edward Kennedy, who I still consider the distilled essence of his party. Uh, <laughs> they were debating something like the motor voter bill, you know, that you can register to vote. It was probably the pizza voter bill. You can, the man who delivers your pizza can register you to vote. <laughs> And Ted Kennedy said an astonishing thing. He said, all change in America begins at the ballot box. Now, Washington believes that. It believes that all change in America is the product of government. I wonder. In the 1790s, a young Yale graduate <clears throat> went south to be a tutor on a plantation, became interested in the problem of separating cotton seed from cotton fiber. Turned out a machine called the Cotton Gin did this young man, Eli Whitney, changed America. Drove us toward a civil war eventually, revolutionized our country. In 1830, out in Midwest and Central Illinois, where I'm from, in 1830 in the town of Grand Detour, Illinois, a young blacksmith got interested in the problem of inventing a self-scouring steel plow that could handle the heavy topsoil of the Middle West in a way that wooden plows couldn't. 
That man's name today is on big green machines all over the world. His name was John Deere, and that change did not begin at the ballot box. It began in the divine spark of one thinking American. When Alexander Graham Bell said down a crackling wire, Watson, come here, I want you, that was not change driven by the ballot box. When Henry Ford in his garage or the Wright brothers in their bicycle shop, or when Ray Kroc driving into the McDonald's Brothers restaurant in San Bernardino, California, got an idea not just for a great corporation, but for a whole new American industry. That change was not driven at the ballot box. That was change produced by individual sparks. That change is an example of what has been, I believe, William Buckley's abiding insight, which is the tremendous fecundity of freedom. Stand back and watch Americans do it. And to get Americans to reconnect with the idea of freedom and its productivity, Bill Buckley has summoned into national service the delights of the English language. I don't know how many of you have been watching the English language trampled to death in what we smilingly call debates between the political candidates recently. A debate is defined in America as a triangular press conference involving Jim Lira and two politicians. <laughs> well, um, you know, two-minute opening statements, 90-minute responses, followed by 60-minute responses, followed by, uh, sorry, 60-second responses, followed by 30-second responses. In 1858, you took two walking-around Senate candidates in the state of Illinois, named named Lincoln and Douglas. They had seven debates. The first guy started talking for an hour. The second guy talked for an hour and a half, and then the first guy talked again for 30 minutes. That was timed, actually. But of course, then English was their first language. And they <laughs> I hope I'm not rude, but I would like to ask, does Al Gore talk that way at home? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm serious. Does he say, well, Tipper, pass the mustard? <laughs> Who do they think they're talking to? Well, you see, American politics has become survival of the briefest. You get 30-second ads, or more important, our politics now is the soundbite on the evening news, but something very peculiar has happened to the soundbite. A soundbite, I mean, your candidate, his words, his mouth, saying something on the evening news. In 1968, when it was Wallace, Nixon, and Humphrey, the average soundbite, the uninterrupted speaking of a candidate was 40 seconds long. Now, you can't say a lot, but you can say something in 40 seconds. By 1988, it had shrunk to nine seconds. 1992, the average soundbite on the evening news was 7.2 seconds long. Now, that happens to be a great benefit to we conservatives, because we conservatives can say almost everything we know, think, and believe in 7.2 seconds. Huh. Well, no. Conservatism is nothing if not concise. The basic conservative message is no less, stop it, cut it out. <laughs> the liberal message is more rococo and has dreams and aspirations and blueprints. I'm not saying it's false, I'm just saying it's complicated. And it takes a long time to deploy it. <laughs> Still, I mean, clearly something has happened in spite of Bill's luminous example to the way we conduct our political controversies. You've all been to Washington. You've been to the Jefferson Memorial, seen those great words carved in stone. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. I have sworn upon the altar of Almighty God on ending hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Again, back then, politicians spoke in whole paragraphs, one right after another. Lincoln, Lincoln at Gettysburg rattled on for two minutes and 50 seconds. That's forever on television. Today he would say, read my lips, no slaves. <laughs> but, well, against this impoverishment of our civic discourse, uh, stands Bill Buckley's example. And it is, I think, even beyond the principles 
uh, on behalf of which he marshals the English language. It is his use of the English language itself that has done as much to elevate American public life as anyone I know. Some people, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are not just known for their excellence, they are known to be the standard of excellence. The greatest, and here I promise my last baseball story, but the greatest baseball story in history happens to be true, and it's a wonderful moral story. Rogers Hornsby, the greatest right-handed hitter in the history of baseball, was at the plate, and there was a rookie on the mound, and the rookie was rationally petrified. And he threw three pitches to Hornsby just off the plate, and the umpire said, ball one, ball two, ball three. Well, the rookie got flustered, and he shouted at the umpire. He said, umpire, those were strikes. The umpire took off his mask and looked out at the mound and said, young man, when you throw a strike, Mr. Hornsby will let you know. <laughs> You see, Hornsby had become the standard. If he didn't swing, it wasn't a strike. The man we are honoring tonight uh, has become the standard of my craft. It's a humble craft, being a columnist. You only require two essential skills. You have to be brief, and you have to change the subject frequently. But when done right, when done nobly, when done really well, a good writer can change the world. We are about to see how. We're about to see a video in which you will see William F. Buckley, the most, and I'm not, there's not a scintilla of hyperbole in this, the most consequential journalist ever. Watch now Bill Buckley in action. The recipient of the Goldwater Award is, I think you'll agree when you see this, as irreplaceable as the man for whom the award is named. And now to present the Goldwater Award, here again is John Norton. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Goldwater asked that I read his letter at this time. Dear John, sorry that I'm unable to be with all of you tonight to enjoy the company of two fine gentlemen, Bill Buckley and George Will. My friendship with Bill Buckley goes way back, more than 40 years, during that time, Bill has been a thorn in the side of the liberal establishment. I believe that Bill Buckley has done more than any man I can think of to advance the cause of limited government in America. For this, all of us owe Bill a huge debt of gratitude. Bill, it gives me a great deal of pleasure knowing that you are receiving the 1996 Goldwater Award. There is no one more deserving than you. George, you have spent your career in the land of Oz, our nation's capital, listening to those liberal politicians. I commend you for finally spending some time in, in wonderful Arizona where the conservatives roam. My thanks to the both of you for making this such a successful event. Sorry I couldn't be with you. Sincerely, Barry Goldwater. On behalf of Senator Goldwater, it gives me great pleasure to present the 1996 Goldwater Award to William F. Buckley, Jr. Bill? It's okay. It's okay. No harm done. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Norton. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, and my immediate host, Mr. Flake. I'm happy to be here, as who, who would not? 
I mean, who would not who thinks to pause uh, gratefully and excitedly on the memory of a moment in American history and the man who, who gave us that moment. Uh, today, a generation later, <clears throat> the moribund uh, pronouncements of the pollsters notwithstanding, uh, everyone in this room believes there is a good deal of intelligent life left in America. <clears throat> as witness, <clears throat> as well as the incumbency of some of the gentlemen to whom we have been reintroduced. <clears throat> Though it continues true that we are given <clears throat> to uh, fitful slumbers, the awakening from one of which came some time after 1964, <clears throat> an awakening not uh, fully realized, as George Will has already pointed out, until 16 years later. For the benefit of those uh, young people in the room whose grade school teachers transcended mathematics, 1964 plus 16 equals 1980, <coughs> which is when Ronald Reagan was elected. The capacity of the American people for uh, such life as uh, we lead when awakened from slumber is, is not in encouraged uh, by public leaders whose search is entirely for emollients. Listening to Mr. Clinton on public policy, we are surprised that he has not come out against death on the ground that it interferes with Medicaid. <laughs> Speaking of education, I'm captivated by my host's uh, pedagogical device of distributing a questionnaire focused on the speaker's biography. That is a very neat uh, means of coaching an audience uh, on what it ought to know, if only for that evening. I'm only, only disappointed that the question it didn't include quotes 11. Name the 10 novels by Mr. Buckley featuring Blackfoot Oaks, followed by 12 here with an order for all 10 of them. <clears throat> but the exercise was, of course, a a game of chance. George Will reminded us a year or so back that the great modern drive to the gambling tables is differently motivated from the passion to gamble at the turn of the century. Back then he observed uh, the scientific world uh, seemed to be telling us that everything that lay in store uh, specified was pre-specified by laws of uh, caus causality. For that reason, uh, many sought concrete means uh, for excitement. Gambling, Mr. Will observed, was a way of asserting the reality of randomness, another name for luck. By contrast, today at the end of the century, uh, Mr. Will put it with that piercing yet graceful concision uh, no other American commentator can match. Quotes, with the weed of pessimism growing in profusion in the National Garden, gambling may be for many people a fatalistic assertion of the belief that most of life is luck. He goes on to explain, if in the new economy, the rewards of life go increasingly to the intellectually gifted, uh, and if that gift is to a significant extent conferred by genetic inheritance, then life is to a significant extent a lottery, won or lost at conception, so one might as well roll the dice as life rolls along. We've been rolling the dice, and not only with our annual deficits, uh, Senator Kyle gives us repeated warnings on our defenselessness, not uh, against the uh, random bad throws of the dice, but random and highly specified targeted weapons, chemical or biological or nuclear. He urged in his speech to the Atlantic Alliance in Prague last May that we ponder these lowering clouds. The true measure of our strength, um, he reminded us, is not simply whether we can be defeated, but whether we can be intimidated. We know that Mr. Dole agrees with Mr. Kyle on the matter of our inexplicable negligence in failing to develop an anti-missile technology, but we also learned uh, with some dismay that in his public confrontation with the President last Sunday, Senator Dole did not make it a point to warn against that uh, exposure. Who knows? 
maybe next uh, Wednesday. Well, Sunnydale has his own style, and we may be left after November simply hoping that uh, North Korea and Iraq and uh, Libya will elect in the future not to disappoint the architects of our problematic defense policies. <laughs> Mr. Dole is as he is. He is not in his forensic manner to be confused with a minor candidate in the Republican primaries, Congressman Bob Dornan, whose approach to politics is more uh, assertive. <laughs> George observed that phenomenon last March as he observes all interesting phenomena and explained about primary candidate Dorn and the quotes, verbal napalm comes trippingly from the tongue of this man <laughs> who once called Southern California liberal money people coke-snorting, wife-swapping, baby-born-out-of-wedlock radical Hollywood lefties. <laughs> there is much to ponder on the eve of the national election. Asked just two days ago at a press conference in Dallas, uh, what advice would I give candidate Dole? I replied that he should forbid his staff from showing him any poll and behave as Senator Goldwater did in 1964. I remember the fascination we all felt during that uh, campaign. He was our standard bearer, uh, in that sense representing a collectivity, but he treated us as individuals. He was disdainful of any inducements to block voters. Sometimes he even gave the impression that his design was to alienate block voters. <clears throat> he had no such intention, I'm sure. Barry Gold was simply engaging in acts of full disclosure. He wanted to exhibit the architectural grandeur of his political cathedral. At once, simple and basic design government should defer where possible to the private sector and prodigious uh, in its fruits. Freedom guaranteed by government permits the flowering of great industry and great art. Senator Goldwater staked out his positions with a benumbing uh, directness, campaigning in St. Petersburg, a center for retired senior citizens. He deplored some of the excesses of the Social Security program. Then he chose Knoxville, Tennessee to wonder out loud whether the TVA Tennessee's greatest shrine it was really a very good idea. <clears throat> then on to Appalachia, <clears throat> where he deplored the Depressed Areas program. <clears throat> the crowning memory of the campaign was the little item at the end of a long anecdotal piece that appeared the day after the election in the New York Times. I have saved it and can still make out the yellow crinkled newsprint. It reads, a neighbor asked, who did you vote for, Lillian? The question was put in Concord, New Hampshire, yesterday to a 72-year-old woman who replied that she had voted for Lyndon Johnson. What do you mean, her neighbor asked? You voted solid Republican for 50 years. The neighbor explained that she was, quote, afraid to vote for Senator Goldwater. Why? Because he will take away my TV. No, 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 her friend assured her. Senator Goldwater is opposed to the TVA, not TV. <laughs> I know, I know, her neighbor replied, but I just didn't want to take any chances. <laughs> <laughs> but although politics is always there for us to take pleasure from, the kind of concern shared by such as John Kyle and J.D. Hayworth and Bob Stump and my absent friends John Shaddock and Jim Colby uh, is hardly parochial. It concerns us uh, all. The debates have not succeeded uh, <clears throat> in isolating a deep divide. The great surprise of Election Day two years ago had to do with a political expression by the majority of voters to the effect that they didn't quite understand what was happening in America or why nothing effective was being done about it. Mr. Clinton's inaugural address the first time around had uh, generated some confusion. Uh, the viewer on that day in January 1953 was justified in coming to uh, personal conclusions about the new president. It was, I think, uh, hard to escape the conviction that uh, Mr. Clinton is a mythogenic figure. The energy, the eye for variety, the desire to please, the expressive face that reflects awe and delight 
even as during his vacation at Martha's Vineyard, he treated every day as though it combined the freshness of the first day on earth with the excitement of the last. <laughs> but he didn't delineate a distinctive political program as, for instance, FDR had done or Ronald Reagan. It wasn't until the president's uh, dogged sponsorship of his health plan that we saw clearly what are his primary policy assumptions, and these have tended to ignore the inverse correlation between dependence on the state and personal independence. The enemy is not uh, as decipherable as before, not incarnated uh, the way he used to be when we had Hitler and Bretzneff to kick around, but the forces that contend against our conservative and libertarian values are hydra-headed. Under Marxism or Leninism, they reached a most advanced form. Communism was history death. But when the Soviet Union fell apart, that did not bring an end to the defiance of known history as distinguished from ideological history. Political fancy is a factor in human imagination. And although the afflictions brought on by profligacy are individuated, they gain great comfort opponent force when they combine in the vehicle of the state. The individual can be a great wastrel and the damage is huge, but it is intimate. Whereas the state engaged in dissipation can do to itself what Argentina did in my lifetime and Barry Goldwater's. In 1939, Argentina's income per capita exceeded that of France. Argentina came close, however, encouraging its progress in the past few years after a long generation of populism to becoming a banana republic. Conservatives were concerned for this reason over the evolution of the Clinton phenomenon. Uh, most initiatives under Mr. Clinton have been centripetal or Washington-oriented. This is a pity uh, in the eyes of conservatives, not only because we have known about the perils of centralized government ever since the Founding Fathers taught us about them, but because, providentially, uh, modern electronic science has revitalized the centrality of the individual. Deregulation, laissez-faire, was always more merely than an administrative convenience. It is the agent of the adjudications of the marketplace. For many years, it was contended that the individual is lost in the great ties of modern commerce but we learned that this is not so, that science has made the marketplace uniquely responsive. George Gilder put it best when he wrote last December, rather than pushing decisions up through the hierarchy, the power of microelectronics pulls them remorselessly down to the individual. One free mind plus a workstation cannot perform any array of regimented minds. How hard this seems to communicate to the majority of the voters. Uh, Bill Clinton has an overwhelming political personality. He appears every few minutes on television and twice as often if there's any death, relatively recent as with Oklahoma City or relatively ancient as St. Petersburg 50 years ago, uh, to memorialize. On Wednesday, he spoke at a memorial for air crash victims, perhaps tomorrow, at a memorial for automobile victims, leaving as many more, for instance, tobacco uh, victims to deplore. He gives the impression of a total immersion in the problems of everybody, as though he had just risen from a Baptist initiation, water coming out of every one of his pores, <laughs> just destined to wash away the problems of industrial workers, farmers, merchants, shipbuilders, gays, deficit watchers, the fish, the trees, and the wildlife. <laughs> The impression works miracles on television as witness his great coup with the kids in the White House soon after he came to office. The viewer would not have been surprised if at the end of the hour Bill Clinton had officially adopted all 40 of them, <laughs> giving them quarters in the White House and all those rooms emptied by his economy drive. <laughs> but we are left with that uh, Lincolnian little window that reassures us that you can't fool all of the people all the time. Is it uh, possible, notwithstanding uh, the polls, that that hard, inquisitive intelligence out there among the American people, 
that bestowed itself in 1994 will yet resolve finally that we aren't getting any real benefit from all this commotion, just a legislative logjam and a lot more government. And that next month, the ebullience will stop. But this time, conclusively, as reality creeps in like iron weed, gradually isolating the ganglion of effusive confusion in the White House, causing the people to say on November the 5th, even as the watchmen sit with such simple solemnity every afternoon at five in the Louvre for closing time, gentlemen. Or maybe we'll have to wait until the slumber dissipates. There is always a great deal to do to guard our liberty. Thomas Jefferson, we like to hope, went a little far when he suggested that once in every generation, in order to keep our liberty, we should expect, as he put it, to water the land with the blood of tyrants and martyrs. But he had a lively point. The government, he said, can only do something for the people in proportion as it can do something to the people. But when gloom threatens, and like Ishmael, we find ourselves tempted to make up the tail end of funeral processions, we need to reflect on the unusual blessings of life in America, to cultivate the faculty of gratitude for things as large as the might and beauty of our country, and as modest as the congregation here tonight, gathered together to celebrate the name of a great public figure. Always we need to cultivate the faculty for gratitude. When I was 13 years old, I was chaperoned here and there along with two sisters of about the same age. About the greater environs of London, my music teacher, whom I revered, was by my side. And when I went to the counter of a little souvenir shop in Stratford-upon-Avon and paid out three or four shillings for Shakespearean sundries I had picked out, an elderly lady behind the counter took my money, returned me some change and then impulsively withdrew from the display case a tiny one-square-inch edition of Romeo and Juliet. Smiling, she handed to me a gift from an elderly lady to a boy. Whereupon I grandly took the sixpence she had just before given me in change and deposited it pompously in her hand, a reciprocal gift. Once outside, I received a resonant scolding from my teacher I had done an offensive thing, she informed me. A gift is a gift, she said. I must learn to accept gifts. They are profaned by any attempt at automatic reciprocity. Some years later, I read in a biography of Abraham Lincoln uh, about an episode that had briefly convulsed uh, the receiving line at the White House. A lady in that line, after taking the president's hand in formal greeting, thrust forward with her left hand a huge bundle of long-stemmed roses, depositing them, in effect, all over Mr. Lincoln. The president and the receiving line were immobilized. Abraham Lincoln smiled and said after the briefest pause, are these really for me? Yes, his guest said, beaming, in that case. The president said, I can think of nothing that would give me more pleasure than to present them to you. Flowers were returned, there were smiles all around. The lady took back her roses and the line moved on. That is an unusual, perhaps a singular exception to my music teacher's injunction against the social sin of reciprocal gifts. Few people in public life or private have managed such uh, extemporaneous grace. The gift uh, attempted in identical tender is corrupted the philanthropic uh, impulse uh, traduced. The unrequited gift in Burke's phrase is one of the unbought graces of life. An attempt to repay in the same tender vulgarizes the offering, gives it a purely economic aspect. Barry Goldwater wrote in the opening pages of his celebrated book that conservatism is, as he put it, a structured view of the human being and of human society in which uh, economics plays only a subsidiary role, but a country, a civilization that gives us such gifts as we routinely dispose of, 
can't be repaid uh, in kind. There's no way we can grandly give to the United States a present of a Bill of Rights in exchange for its having given us uh, a Bill of Rights. Uh, Senator Goldwater, in his defense of American individualism, never suggested that we knew, do not owe obligations to our, our patrimony rendered in whatever way, not uh, excluding such attentions as he has paid to the culture of surviving Indian tribes in Arizona. <clears throat> the numbing, benumbing thought that we owe nothing to Plato and Aristotle, nothing to the prophets inspired to write the Bible, nothing to the generations who fought for freedoms activated in the Bill of Rights, suggests that we are grateful only to the government that gives us the welfare state. We cannot hope to repay in kind what the founders gave us, but to live lives without any sense of obligation to those who made possible lives as tolerable as our own within the frame of the human predicament God imposed on us, a lack of gratitude to our parents who suffered to raise us, to our teachers who labored to teach us, to the scientists who prolong the lives of our children and friends is spiritually uh, atrophying. We cannot uh, repay the gift of the Beatitudes with their eternal searing meaning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But to fail to feel gratitude when walking through the corridors of the Metropolitan Museum, when listening to the music of Bach and Beethoven, when exercising our freedoms to speak or to vote is more than to profane spontaneous generosity. It is to decline to express, however clumsily, to feel, however coarsely, our gratitude for generosity, human and divine, for the great wellsprings of human talent and concern that gave us Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Mark Twain, our parents, our friends, and yes, that a remarkable man in whose name we gather tonight, who enlivened the historical movement on whose resurgence so much depends. We need a rebirth of gratitude for those who have cared for us, living and mostly dead. The high moments of our way of life are their gift to us. You have done me a great honor by letting me in so close within the shadow of a man who has so greatly distinguished uh, this vital community. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am loath to let the evening come to a close because tomorrow you wake up and live in this wonderful valley and I return to Washington for a rendezvous with Donaldson. Uh, but I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be a part of this uh, and for what you have done for the Goldwater Institute, all it has done for Arizona, and what it was privileged to do for Bill Buckley tonight. The evening is adjourned.